Good morning. I'm Elizabeth Yalcutt, Emma Willard School, Class of 2004, Godolphin School, Class of 2005, and Barnard College, Class of 2011, which I hope is the most obnoxious sentence I'm going to say all day. Normally, I would not start off a talk by citing my educational background because A, no one cares, and B, seriously, that's obnoxious. In this case, I swear it is relevant. All three of those schools are single sex. Yes, I spent nine years in classrooms with no boys. And now I'm a web developer at Columbia University. I am the success story that these schools love to tell about the benefits of their curriculum, about the effects single gender education has on their students. Gold star all round. But I want to look a little deeper. Before I really get going, let me take a second for some definitions and disclaimers. I'm using the terms single sex and single gender interchangeably, and I'm talking about my experience as a cis woman. Single sex educational institutions have started grappling with the gender binary and how they can include and serve students that don't fit into that binary, especially trans women, over the last 10 years in ways they haven't before. But I'm not really approaching gender in a nuanced way here. My experience in single sex education was entirely Anglophone, mostly secular, and paid for out of private funds, so there's a definite class element to my experience. And I'm white and haven't attended any institutions where I've been a racial minority, so please listen to what I say with that framework in mind. Stereotype threat, as I'm using it today, means the risk of confirming assumptions about a group that you belong to the way our brains help us be the way we think other people expect us to be. For example, a white person reminded of the phrase, white men can't jump, before an athletic competition, even one that didn't include jumping, might do more poorly than they otherwise would. A variable as simple as there being boys in the, class, in the same classroom can, can decrease girls' performances on math tests, as demonstrated by at least two peer-reviewed studies since 2000. Later in this talk, I'll be referring to the pipeline, which is a metaphor for the pathway through education and into a career in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, aka STEM. Often people talk about the pipeline being leaky because women and minorities start the process that should direct them to a STEM career, but then they change majors, or don't take a job in the field they have a degree in, or they leave for a different career path in early career. There are a lot of explanations for why this happens. It's appalling. And today, I'm going to be focusing on the early parts of the pipeline. I'm not doing this to erase the latter attrition. Julie Pagano's brilliantly bitter remark, so many diversity and tech efforts are about getting young women into the pipeline. Ignore the fact that there's a meat grinder at the end. Should be part of every discussion of the pipeline, but rather to stay focused. Girls and women in single-sex schools get higher grades in math and science classes, are more confident in their math and science skills, and believe fewer stereotypes about gender and STEM. And this is awesome! A lot of single-sex schools have embraced this, touting the rates at which their graduates go on to STEM majors in college, receive STEM degrees, both undergraduate and graduate, and work in STEM careers. Again, awesome. But, come on. You knew that was coming. But all this emphasis on how amazing these young women are, how much they're breaking down barriers and proving stereotypes wrong and defying sexist cliches, this can backfire for some people, like me. All through my educational career, I avoided STEM classes like the plague. I tried to talk my college counselor into letting me drop math and science my senior year of high school. I lost that argument and had to take a science class that year, although I was allowed to avoid the math department. I graduated from college with a degree in history and actually changed my thesis topic when I realized my proposal was inevitably leading me to quantitative analysis. By all logic, I am the last person who should have ended up in a STEM career. So what went wrong all those years in single sex education? How did I end up here, and how did my education hold me back on the way? To begin, I want to point to Courtney Martin's perfectly incisive framing of the larger problem. 
We are the daughters of the feminists who said, you can be anything. And we heard, you have to be everything. There is so much pressure on young women from basically every direction. The entire process of growing up, learning how the world works, who you are in it, this is so hard. STEM is another landscape where we're placing expectations on people. It's not enough in this environment to take and pass your required math class. Nope, you're expected to break the curve. You're expected to take the next course in the sequence, to get a STEM-related internship, and then a job to break the glass ceiling. To be clear, no one said this to me. I'm sure my instructors would be horrified to hear I thought that this was what they wanted from me, but I felt it was clear. There was no such thing as good enough when it came to STEM. If I showed up in a physics class, I had better be prepared to perform, or I would be letting down the side. Women everywhere would suffer because of my inadequacy. Madame Emma Willard, my high school's founder, who revolutionized girls' education, as we were frequently reminded, would be disappointed in me. Let me tell you about a friend of mine. We went to college together. In pre-adolescence, she won a prize twice for her academic achievements in math. By the time she was 14 or 15, she was being encouraged to start the course track that would lead to advanced placement courses, calculus. And after that, well, sky's the limit. Maybe NASA. But she was afraid of disappointing people. Any time she failed, every time she failed, it wasn't just the equation baffling her that was the problem. No, her reputation as someone good at math was on the line. The teachers who had encouraged her, their judgment of her skills would come into question. The value of the prizes she'd won would be diminished. She decided it was all too much. She didn't want to be the girl going up against that particular stereotype and concentrated on the other things she loved and was good at and where she wasn't the only person like her in the room. She became a professional violinist. Music, an underpaid, fiercely competitive field that demands hundreds of hours of training and practice to be mediocre, thousands to be decent, and yet it intimidated her less than math. I swear I am not making this story up. What does this tell us about how much danger she felt she was in when she was being encouraged with the best of intentions to enter the pipeline? If even an environment devoted to making young women confident can have this poison in it, what happens when your surroundings are even less safe? I want to remind you that demanding that every woman be amazing is unrealistic and toxic and terrifying. Sure, let's celebrate Marie Curie and her achievements. Being the only person to receive Nobel Prizes in two different disciplines is awe-inspiring. But can we also talk about the adjunct professor teaching two biology core sections at the local community college? She's a scientist too, even if she doesn't make it into the history books. There's evidence that showing young women role models who are women can be part of countering harmful stereotypes both for young women who are already planning to go into STEM and for young women who have self-selected out of STEM, but exalting goddesses on pedestals isn't what they need, I think. There is value in realistic role models, in women who are human-sized, who have made choices and compromises and survived. Marie Curie, sure, Lise Metner, sure, but also Wendy Eld, who's been teaching math at Emma Willard since 1996, and Shoshi Roberts, who founded Ladies Who Code, now League of Women Coders, and has pink hair and correct opinions about JavaScript. <laughs> please don't say, please don't think that I'm saying that we should encourage young women to lower their expectations of how amazing they can be, but we don't have to imply that anything short of changing the landscape of their chosen discipline is unworthy of them. So that's one thing that held me back from exploring STEM subjects while I was in single sex environments. The belief that there was no room to fail, the implied expectation of perfection. Carol Dweck, a fellow Barnard alumna, has published research on how people think about learning, writing that there's a continuum between people who believe their intelligence and abilities are innate to them and people who believe they can develop their talents. She generally calls these opposing views fixed and growth mindsets and points out that for someone who's using a fixed mindset, failure is a referendum on them, while for someone more on the growth end of the spectrum, failure is less of a crisis. I can't tell you how much I wish her research had been published 10 years earlier. I could have used it. 
Unfortunately, it came out while I was in college, and I didn't get to know it until about five years later. I can easily see that for my classmates, who were already confident about their STEM skills, the way our schools clearly wanted them to succeed in these fields would have been a gift beyond words. Not just having opportunities, but actively being encouraged to pursue them. Not just access to advanced coursework and mentors, but not needing to argue they could succeed. My classmate who finished the AP Calculus sequence sophomore year and went on to Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute across town the next year got a running start into the pipeline, and maybe that momentum made her a little safer, a little braver, as she entered the wider world. And now that I've come to the dark side, where there are fewer cookies than I was promised, and am firmly mid-career in STEM, my background as a graduate of single-sex schools is, I think, an advantage, and may well keep me in the pipeline. I'm used to hearing women's voices in positions of authority and will notice and call out the meetings at work where I, or a coworker who's a woman, gets disregarded or talked over. I spent a lot of my adolescence and young adulthood exposed to women who, are, who were, in fact, brilliant or even just competent at STEM work and being explicitly taught counterarguments to the sexist cliches that abound in our society. If and when someone tries the arguments we saw rehashed yet again, last week in the Google memo on me, I can rattle off not only the counterexample of Marie Curie, but also Françoise barré sinoussi Maria Geppert Mayer, and Dorothy Hodgkin, all Nobel laureates in medicine, physics, or chemistry. And also the instructor who put up with me in trigonometry junior year with the patience of Atlas. And the astronomy TA who held my hand through my required two semesters of lab a few years later. I have the vocabulary to name my experiences in a sexist industry and to lift up my colleagues who are affected by the racism and classism that I mostly escape. Being able to name the systemic poison of being penalized for negotiating salary and the interpersonal poison of being interrupted every time in a staff meeting means it's easier for me to resist the effects, the slow erosion of my willingness to work in an industry that sometimes seems to be actively rejecting who I am. Being around smart women with varied skill sets was and is a valuable experience. And I'm mostly grateful I had the opportunity to attend the schools I did. But remember, I spent my time in those spaces cranky about the environmental emphasis on STEM. I think a lot of what I resented about the ways my schools talked about STEM comes from overcorrecting from faculty and administration trying to ensure that the fears of the society we live in didn't harm the math and science performance of their students. They were just trying to praise young women for doing well in STEM work. But we can't let our attempts at bringing women into the pipeline turn into rejecting the skills and knowledge that have been associated with them. Not just because that's gross and doing the work of misogyny under cover of feminism, although that should be enough on its own, but also because it's inefficient. More knowledge about the world we live in and share with other people is better. My work as a user experience developer is significantly enhanced by my background in art history. There are a growing number of programs like Girls Develop It and Code with Clossy and STEMETs, which put resources, time, energy, money, into supporting young women as they explore STEM in a single sex environment. There are maker spaces that are women centered like Spanning Tree, Merge Sort, Seattle Attic, Double Union. These are organizations which can give other women many of the advantages I got from my experiences at Emma Willard and Godolphin and Barnard. And I'd like to think that by talking about the various ways my time there hurt me, we can do better. I'd like to think that me showing up at League of Women Coders hack nights even when I don't have anything to work on, is going to make a little bit of difference to someone just starting out. Thank you for your time. I was brutal with cuts, so we actually have a couple of minutes for Q&A if people are interested. I have a question. Yeah. Yeah. So what do you feel like is, what is it that, makes you get up in the morning to continue to work in this field, right? So what is it that continues to inspire you in such a, as you said, single gender field? 
I really like the work. I really like solving problems. It's really satisfying work. If I could do it without contact with human beings, that would be really great. <laughs> Unfortunately, that doesn't seem like it's gonna happen anytime soon, so I put up with the human beings in order to build interesting things. Hi, thanks for speaking. Um, so I was wondering if you have an opinion on how we can encourage young women bees, and that term women bees is like women by choice people, um, to enter STEM fields or in a way that doesn't put this pressure on them because there's still external societal factors that like definitely discourage them. So I was wondering if you thought of a way to balance that without adding the like, you have to be a superhero mm -hmm. about it feel. One of the things I think would have helped me as someone who self-selected out of STEM fairly early on and then self-selected back in would have been STEM meeting me where I was and talking about the stuff I was already interested in. The math and music thing, the, ma the connection between math and music probably would have kept my friend a lot more invested in math even after she'd started pursuing violin seriously. In my case, doing like big data statistical analysis on literature would have been something I would have been a lot more interested in than topography or whatever <laughs> it was that I was currently flailing at in my math classes at, in school. Thank you. So um, I went to the Albany Academy for boys and that You were probably on one of my buses when we, when we <laughs> shared, yeah, okay, Hi. Yeah, um, so I'm wondering like, what kinds of things do you think that sex segregated education can do to accommodate trans people within that context? Because one of the things that I was really scared about in high school was if I, if I were to come out and transition, I would have to completely switch schools and mm -hmm. move to an entirely different context. Yeah. I don't want to imply that I think single sex education is something that everybody should be part of. There's definitely space for co-ed education and I think that there are a lot of ways in which co-ed experiences can be incredibly valuable. And in terms of how single sex spaces can handle trans people, there are really smart people trying really hard to fix, to figure that out. They're generally not doing a great job and I really wish I had a better answer, but mostly what I've got is be welcoming to the people who want to be in your space. Thanks. It's one of the reasons that I use the phrase historically single sex because a non-zero number of Emma Willard and Barnard alumni have in fact transitioned and no longer identify as women. So historically single sex seems to be sort of threading the needle a little, maybe. We have time for one more question. Hi, you said you called out moments when you feel you or your female coworkers' opinions are disregarded in meetings. Mm -hmm. How do you do that in a way that doesn't cause the offender to become defensive? Um, one of the techniques that my coworkers and I actually stole from the Obama White House is when someone, when one of us gets interrupted, somebody else will step in and say, actually I was, interested in the point that name was making, or I, I agree with name and what she was saying, making it very clear that they, we want to go back to the thing the other person was saying. That's worked out reasonably well, and occasionally I just straight up lose my temper and say I was talking. Mostly that does seem to work. It's a small enough team that and informal enough that me standing there going, nope, nope, still talking, isn't completely out of the norm. Thank, Thank you very much. You. I'll be around for at least a good portion of the day, so come and chat if you want.